family held a memorial last fall. Uh, and um, this is her professional family um, answering, answering that memorial or presenting our own memorial. Um, and I have to warn everyone that this event is being recorded and should you not wanna be recorded, uh, please uh, mute your audio and mute your video and your audio will be muted during most of the presentations anyway. So uh, we're going to begin with a few words from Tyrus Miller, our Dean of Humanities at UC Irvine. Thank you, Gail. Um, I wanna greet our speakers and the members of the uh, UC Irvine community and the friends, neighbors, and also readers of Ruth Kugler, um, who we honor and memorialize today. This is, of course, a solemn occasion. It marks the loss of a great mind and a great spirit um, who through her writing and her teaching and her person touch many other lives around her. But I also wanna say that it's a celebration of her courageous and inspiring life and of the traces that she's left in our thoughts and our words. I've come recently to UCI. Um, I didn't know Ruth Kluger well. Uh, but I did get to meet her early in my time here. We have a group of distinguished uh, speakers and panelists who, who will speak more at length about her accomplishments as a scholar, teacher, and writer. So I'll simply say that I'm honored to open this memorial at UC Irvine where Ruth Kluger was our colleague. And I wanna welcome all of you in attendance and our speakers, uh, Gail Hart, Professor Emerita at UCI, who will speak about Ruth Kluger's scholarly work Sandra Gilman from Emory University, who will be speaking about her first publications, her adolescent poetry in light of camp literature. Irene uh, Kekandis from uh, Dartmouth University. Um, her, her title is, and uh, her topic, On Being Young During the Judea Side and Living to Write About It. And then following that, a panel discussion, including our speakers with UCI professors Anka uh, Biandara, Kai Evers and Glenn Levine. So I will um, now give things back to Gail um, to speak about Ruth and her, her scholarship. Thank you so much, Tyrus. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, this morning session is meant to honor Ruth as a scholar and as a writer. And um, though she's widely known for Weiterleben and her other autobiographical writings, um, Deal with She's already a distinguished, um, renowned scholar of German literature uh, before Weiterleben ever came out. She was, um, her, well, her dissertation was on the Baroque epigram, and she moved forward in time from that to uh, become um, you know, an internationally renowned expert on uh, Lessing and on Kleist, uh, most especially on Kleist. She did distinguished work on Austrian literature. Uh, she was an amazing reader of poetry, almost right up to the end. She published a series of interpretations of poetry in the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, she was also a pioneer in women's studies and in Holocaust studies. Um, we're going to spend more time today on her um, on her writing rather than her scholarship. And the two speakers, as, as Tyrus mentioned, will be addressing Ruth as uh, a writer. And each of our speakers will speak for 25 minutes followed by, by the panel discussion. Um, the first is Sandra Gilman. And Sandra Gilman is a distinguished professor of the liberal arts and sciences, as well as professor of psychiatry at Emory University a cultural literary historian. He's the author or editor of over 90 books, which I'm not going to list um, all of them. Uh, but uh, recently he has written Stand Up Straight, A History of Posture. Um, and uh, among the others, he is an author of the basic study of the visual stereotyping of the mentally ill, uh, seeing the insane, as well as the standard study of Jewish self-hatred. For 25 years, he was a member of the humanities and medical faculties at Cornell University. For six years, he held the Henry R. Luce Distinguished Service Professorship of the Liberal Arts and Human Biology at the University of Chicago. 
For four years, he was a distinguished professor of the liberal arts and medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago, where he created the Humanity Laboratory. laboratory. Um, somehow uh, in this um, shortened uh, biography, he neglected to mention that he was also a distinguished uh, visiting professor at UCI for a quarter. Um, he's also been a visiting professor at uh, universities in North America, South Africa, the, the United Kingdom, Germany, Israel, China, and New Zealand. He was president of the Modern Language Association in 1995. He was awarded a Doctor of Laws at the University of Toronto in 1997. Uh, elected an honorary professor at the Free University in Berlin and is an honorary member of the American Psychoanalytic Association and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he worked with Ruth Kluger early on at Case Western University. Go ahead, Sandra. Thank you very, very much. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about names. I want to talk about names because those of you who remember your reading of the Leviathan, of Hobbes's Leviathan, remembered Hobbes evoking Genesis and defining power as what the capacity to name and to enforce definitions. Ruth said much the same thing in Vatalib. I'm going to paraphrase quotes rather than uh, read them aloud. Uh, she said that uh, we always have new names for the Choban, for the Holocaust, because each time we evoke it, the words quickly dissipate in our mouths. Naming is important. When I met her, she was in point of fact Ruth Angris. I met Tom only much later divorced, moved from Berkeley. I had moved to Cleveland from uh, New Orleans where I'd been teaching at Dillard. Um, she was, in point of fact, as I've said before, an intimidating colleague. Intimidating not because she was a survivor, not because she was a refugee. I was raised among survivors and refugees, but because she could quote poetry. She could quote it easily without any hesitation in English, German, and French. That was truly intimidating. But I got to know her also as someone very different. She was also R.K. Angris. She and I were both working on our first publications in 1968. Um, why I said to her, are you RK? That's weird. Why are you RK Angris? She said, because if I were Ruth, no one would take seriously anything I would publish. And she was damn right. So she is RK. She goes from Ruth Angris to RK Angris. And by the way, we had this, I think, positive competitive moment. She was working on Kafka. And she was working on Zahra Mazok, as was I. I was reading at that point, Kraft Debing. And I will point out to you, she beat me to the punch. Her Zahra Mazok article trumped mine by a year. But it was R.K. Angris, that name, that was her scholarly name. That summer, the summer of 1969, I found myself, as I did every summer in West Berlin, and every summer in West Berlin, I would um, take the U-Bahn uh, over to East Berlin and with a pound of coffee um, and have coffee with my dear friend Herbert Jakob at the Academy der Wissenschaften. Um, and uh, I would give him a pound of Western coffee. He would give me a cup of the most execrable East German coffee. And we would chat about literature. What I always ask, what, what's new in the bookstore? What should I read? And he said, you know, there's a wonderful translation of a novel from the Polish. Um, and I finished my coffee and I did what I always did, which is because I had the 25 Ostmark that we had to exchange to go from west to east. I went to the Karl Marx Buchhandlung. Now, 
Those of you who would not experience this, but knew it from the film, there's this extraordinary scene in the Slavnes Andon um, in which the Stasi officer uh, who'd been spying on a writer goes into the Karl Marx Buchhandlung and picks up a book of the man he'd been spying on, opens to the de dedication and finds it, the book dedicated to him. The Karl Marx Buchhandlung was the bookstore. By the way, the slide is a pun. Um, it used to be Stalin Allee, then became Karl Marx Allee. Um, and so I, I had my 25 Ostmark, right? And I immediately bought what was not actually a translation from the Polish at all, but the greatest novel written in German about the Holocaust, written, I'm not even going to say by a survivor. Yes, written by a survivor, Jörg, Jörg Becker, Jacob the Liar. I think it is the greatest novel about the Holocaust written in the German language. But it was only nine marks, only nine Ostmark, and you had to get rid of the money because otherwise they would, they would take it from you at the border. And I looked around and I found this book, an anthology, by the way, big, beautiful, exquisite book um, called Welch Wort in die Kälte gerufen, what, a, what words that have been call, uh, shouted into the cold. And I went back um, to Cleveland at the end of the summer, as was my want, and my book purchases dribbled in by mail. We used to mail, remember the mails? They don't exist anymore, but we used to have something called the US Postal Service. Um, and the back, they would come in, I would wrap them in paper and they would arrive and they would arrive in my office and I snipped the cords and opened them. And as I'm perusing them uh, as they arrived in my office, uh, Ruth came by, we, we lived this house which we occupied, which was the German department at Case Western Reserve. It was an old mansion and we all had sort of rooms and Ruth's was across the hall and she would stick her nose in periodically. And so I'm unpacking and she looked at the books on my desk and she said, oh, I have a poem in that. I have a poem in that. And I said, you have a poem in this anthology? She said, oh yeah, yeah, I have a poem in it. And so I, I looked and I said, no, I, I can't find it. She said, oh, oh, you have to look under Ruth Kluger, in which I found it was two stanzas of a poem. And I read it and I was blown away. I mean, this is, according to the, again, the notes in the background, this is a 14 year old girl um, who has written this poem and these East German anthologists, I learned later also there's a, an earlier West German anthology. And I have to say here, we really do have to understand that the East Germans dealt much better with the Nazi past, certainly in the 1960s, than did their West German colleagues, many of whom had been Nazis, okay? So Ruth then came by later and she gave me a stack of Xeroxes, a whole stack of Xeroxes. She said, here, read the poems. I read them and I filed them away and I filed them here too, not just in the cabinet. And in the 1980s then, I sat down and wrote about the poetry in the camps, the poetry actually written in the camps and wrote about specifically Ruth's poem called Der Kamin uh, that I translated as The Furnace, um, a poem that had appeared in one, actually in two um, army newspapers written for the civil um, population, a kind of um, re-education before re-education in June of 1945. Now, these poems were ascribed to Ruth, Ruth, Ein Kind schrieb aus Auschwitz, a child wrote from Auschwitz. And the poems are there in their totality, excerpted, as I said, in Welch ein Wort in die Kälte. And in my essay, I translated it, um, Ruth's poem, Ruth meaning this 14 year old's poem. Um, and not by the way, the other poem, the other poem which was pu uh, published at that time is called Auschwitz, and Ruth doesn't republish it. And there's a reason for that. 
because in point of fact, it deals with a God, which is, this is not a death of God poem. It's a, a, dis, a, a poem of desperation about a God that no one believed in and no one could evoke. A few years later, a graduate student came to me and said, can you possibly suggest a dissertation topic? And this happens, I know, to academics all the time. Um, I was thinking about the poems. And I said, why don't you write on poems from the camps? This was a young man named Andres Nada. He wrote an absolutely first-rate dissertation with my colleague, David Bathrick. Was I happy that he wrote with Bathrick than me? Of course not. I was very unhappy. Um, but the dissertation eventually evolved into a brilliant book called Traumatic Verses that won in 2008 the Modern Language Association Prize for Independent Scholars. It's the best book on Ruth's poetry, the best book on the poetry in the camps. I get my revenge against Andreas, by the way. He is today a psychotherapist in Berlin. So I win and a first-rate scholar. Now, Ruth talks about the poetry in Weiter Leben, about this early poetry. And she says, look, I'm a kid. I read stuff in school. I've got this fragments of poetry. And she always had these fragments of poetry in my head, these bourgeois anthologies of poems we all had to memorize in, uh, in school. I can still give you the first three verses of Hiawatha. I won't, but I could, right? And she then does something which interested me. Ruth Kluger in Weiter Leben reads Ruth, the 14-year-old poet. She talks about the superficial children's verses, a childlike combination of um, disguise and anxiety. But one has to understand, she says, that even words of poetry that no longer have an edge, that no longer have real meaning, take on meaning. And here she quotes Teddy Adorno, um, which you have to do in any book on the Holocaust. You shouldn't, but you have to do, which says basically after Auschwitz, no one can write poetry. And what Ruth says, and it's really important that in Auschwitz, you wrote poetry in order to keep your soul above water, right? The other book she reads, again, the canon in the 80s. The canon is she reads Primo Levi. She reads Vita, in Vita Lem, she reads Sequestro de Lonomo. Um, and she talks about um, Levi as a kind of um, mirror of what goes on in terms of the authority within the camp. But having read, right, having read uh, Levy, she, of course, had also read the central chapter in Levy's book. This is the chapter, which all of you know, the chapter called the Conto, uh, the Conto of Ulysses. Levy is going to teach Jean, a young French a refugee working with him in the chemical factory is going to teach him some Italian. How is he going to teach him? He's going to teach him trying to bring bits of Dante out of his memory. Like Ruth is bringing bits of poetry out of her memory. And what is really important is he says, look, listen to me, Jean, listen to me. I'm going to talk to you about Dante, not for your sake, but for my sake. Levy reports. Think of your breed, he quotes Dante. You're for brutish ignorance, your metal was not made. You were made men to follow after knowledge and excellence. And suddenly Dante says, I hear this poetry. This poetry I know in my ears. And for a moment, I forgot who I am and where I am. Poetry, not prose, not drama, poetry, fragments of poetry, badly remembered saves. Now he'd sent that chapter to Jean Sanuel, to Jean the picky little, the little boy, to read before it's published. And 
something weird happens. In other words, Jean has read this and roughly half a decade, eight, nine years later, there is a meeting of the survivors of the camps and Jean shows up and Primo Levi writes about this meeting and he has in the back of it in this book called The Reawakening in 1963, a kind of an index. He wants to tell us about the people whom he mentions in the book in a sense biographical dictionary. Who, who is Jean? He says, Jean in this afterward, the piccolo of the Canto of Ulysses is alive and well. His family had been wiped out. He has a new family started. Strange was it may, as strange as it may seem, he has forgotten much of his year in Monowitz in the camp at Auschwitz. How can you forget? Not only does he forget the camp, but he forgets Primo Levi's account of the camp because forgetting is at the core of writing. It is not only the meaning, but the central meaning of why Poetry is important in Ruth's life. She writes, the farther one gets away, she says, from the actual events, events I carry around with me in my memory, she says, the more my memory is like even people who have not experienced, not experienced trauma. I, as an adult, am not Ruth Angris or R.K. Angris or Ruth, a child from Auschwitz. Sarah Horowitz describes this elegantly. She says, between verisimilitude and veracity yawns a wide gulf. Unlike a bare chronology which aspires to the facts as such, the literary text in avowing its own artifice, rhetoricity and contingent symbol making threatens to shift and ultimately destroy the grounds by which one measures one set of truth claims or one historical interpretation against the other. And I want to end with an anecdote about another person with a lot of different names, Paul Ceylon, born Paul Anschel, or maybe Ansel. Ruth tells the story about how a student of hers in Göttingen got really pissed at her for having written a parody of some late Ceylon poems. Now, those of you who've studied Ceylon, and many of you have, know that the late poems are, they use a kind word, or maybe not such a kind word, Heideggerian. They demand a lot of work. And don't always, and here I'm speaking for myself, warrant that work. Okay. But why was the student in Göttingen pissed? Because you don't parody people who survived the Holocaust. And as Ruth says, he is not a poet to this student. He is the author of that poem, The Fugue of Death. The Fugue of Death, by the way, which is incredibly evocative and parallel to Ruth's poem called The Furnace or The Chimney del Camin that she published at 14. Ruth, the child from Auschwitz, not Paul Anschel, the adult who survives the camps. And she says, this is the problem. She is, the student is reading Ceylon, reading Ceylon, not as a poet, not as a great poet, but merely as a survivor. And that we refuse to do in reading all of her names. Ruth is the best reader of Ruth and the readings that she gives us are what her legacy really is. I want to thank Gail. I want to thank 
um, Percy and Dan for allowing me to speak today. And I wish you all a shenim dung. Hi, <laughs> thank you very much, Sandra. I had trouble uh, unmuting myself, uh, but please accept my mute applause uh, for that really stirring account of Ruth. That, and it sounds so much, so much like her. One really recognizes her in that. So thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Irene Kakandis of Dartmouth College. Um, he is the Dartmouth College Professor of German Studies and Comparative Literature, teaches also in the fields of women's gender and sexuality studies and Jewish studies. Her publications include Teaching the Representation of the Holocaust, Daddy's War, a para-memoir, um, Let's Talk About Death, uh, in Eastern Europe Unmapped, edited with uh, Yulia Komska. In the forthcoming volume she edited on being adjacent to historical violence is uh, 2021. She's a past president of the German Studies Association and of the International Society for the, Narr of the Study of Narrative Literature and has edited the series Interdisciplinary German Cultural Studies for De Goethe Verlag since 2005. Um, the, her title has changed slightly uh, since, uh, since we sent out the um, schedule, and it is considering Weiterleben and still alive in the context of Holocaust life narratives, Irene. Great. Well, I want to thank Yale and Ruth's family and my colleagues in University of California at Irvine for inviting me to be with you today. Um, it's not quite accurate to say that Ruth Kluger and I were friends, but I do believe we liked each other quite a bit. And we were Pierre Du, so I'll use her first name throughout um, with deepest respect for her as a scholar. Um, our paths crisscrossed in many, many ways. For one thing, um, my advisor of my undergraduate and graduate theses, Dorit Kohn, was also a Germanist and she was originally from Vienna, as was Ruth, of course, and the two of them knew each other as colleagues in the field of German literature. Dorit was several years older than Ruth. Her family made it out of Vienna just on the eve of the Anschluss, the annexation of Austria by Nazi Germany, but she never talked about it, at least never to me. Though she did mention Ruth, I never quite understood what Dorit made of Ruth's decision to write about her experiences of persecution as a Jew, given Dorit's own reticence on the matter. I long wondered about that, especially after I began to teach, research, and publish in the field of Holocaust studies myself, and in that context began a relationship to Ruth not a consciously pursued one, but one that stretched over two decades and was incredibly generous on her part. There's the time in 1991 as a young assistant professor when I went up to her after her MLA paper on kitsch, porn, and the Holocaust. And she not only talked to me about it and my work, but she literally handed me her copy of the paper she had just read. And there's the time a few years later when I must have sent her my first article on Holocaust video testimony, and she sent back her trenchant chapter on the theme of anti-Semitism in the work of Austrian Jews that she published in a book co-edited by Sandra Gilman, my co-panelist. The dedication reads, for Irene, another piece of the puzzle in return for yours, Ruth. There are many places we both walked, though not at the same time, New York, Princeton, University of Vermont. What fun we had on a post MLA 2011 car ride from Los Angeles to Irvine with Gail Hart and Ursula Malendorf. Ruth was not just witty, but a very social being as those of you who knew her better than I are well aware. And I'm so grateful for having had the opportunity to get to know her over the next several days during which I gave a lecture and hung out with her and her Irvine colleagues. This led to my most extended contact with Ruth around my suggestion that she be the keynote speaker at the 2013 German Studies Association meeting for which I also organized a panel on her memoir that she attended. Her address, The Future of Holocaust Literature was absolutely brilliant. And fortunately you can read it in the German Studies Review. 
She hung out with me after the keynote address and I was so flummoxed that I didn't know where to find the party she said she would enjoy going to. How I regretted our parting when I realized that what I thought was going to be a late night business meeting I was obliged to attend was actually just the kind of lively party she'd been seeking. I realized today's event is not exactly a party, but I feel honored to be in the company of so many who knew her, and I hope our tone will be more upbeat than sad. The most vigorous crisscrossing with Ruth started and continues through her writing, especially through her unforgettable memoir, Weiterleben. I bought the book shortly after it was released in Germany, and I just happened to be in London soon after the British release of Ruth's English language version, and I bought that too. A friend in Vienna sent me one of the several subsequent republications of the German version when it was selected for Eine Stadt, Ein Buch, One City, um, One Book, which was a program in Vienna. Her book was selected in 2008. I regularly teach Still Alive in the American edition in my courses analyzing the Judaicide and responses to it. Somewhere along the way, I acquired the French translation. So I actually own five editions of Ruth's book. Brief as what follows must be, I offer this to Ruth as one more piece of the puzzle in return for yours. By this now 76 year distance to the liberation of the concentration and extermination camps, we possess a very large body of works by survivors of those places and other experiences of persecution. In this paper, I take stock of the range of personal narration about the Holocaust and the special place of Weiterleben and its author within it. I begin with terminology. Along with Primo Levi, I ask you to please excuse me. I use the term Holocaust reluctantly because I do not like it, but I use it to be understood. Due to its religious origin implying forms of explanation, justification, or sacralization, many, as myself, object to its use. Words like shora, khorban, meaning catastrophe, erase agency. There's the word genocide, but that's not specific enough. Some use the term the Nazis themselves used, endlösung, final solution, but most of us reject that. The term I've come to use the most myself is Nazi Judaicide. Now, Ruth goes over some of this in her memoir, and she has an important conclusion. Quote, I don't care particularly which is the best term, as long as there is a word, any word, that unambiguously refers to what we're talking about without the need for a lengthy circumlocution to pinpoint a particular catastrophe and distinguish it from others, end of quote. So following Ruth's Q, I will mainly use Holocaust in these remarks precisely as a shortcut to that lengthy circumlocution, which would list all the categories of victims and detail many different forms of persecution and responses to the persecution. This would include boycotts, emigration, pogroms, slave labor, slaughters, large and small, industrial killing and gas vans and death camps, but also emigration, hiding, assumes identities, concentration and ghettoization. My second terminological point concerns the distinction between life writing and life narrative. This latter is a term introduced by Sidoni Smith and Julia Watson, where life narrative includes narrating about the self in any genre, not just prose. The word memoir has a less agreed upon definition, though it too concerns personal narrative about the writer's life experience. I'd like to note that most early reviews of Ruth's work call it book, buch. I mean my phrase Holocaust life narrative then to refer to communication through any number of media about the intended prejudicial, violent and murderous events perpetrated by the German Nazis and their sympathizers meant to harm the author or creator of the life narrative. Taking a very quick, so therefore inevitably idiosyncratic tour through the terrain of Holocaust life narratives, I wanna emphasize that these narratives legibility to a larger public, and I wanna mention events that help change degrees of legibility, by which I mean literally whether it was received by others and also the extent to which those others could take in the narrative's message. Diaries, letters, eyewitness reports, professional medical writing, reparation applications, visual and musical composition and poetry are all genres that were used to try to get the message across. 
The single most widely read work of all those created during or after the perpetration is the diary of Anne Frank. We know that though Frank first wrote to please herself, after hearing a call for testimony on the radio, she changed her intentions, began rewriting the diary and had eventual publication in mind. We also know that hers is a powerful testimony to the experience of hiding. Still, the diary does not include any of the horrors that its author eventually experienced during deportation and internment, including those directly leading to her death. Now, there are many other diaries worth reading. For instance, that of the Polish teenager Rutka Laskier, but most were essentially unknown to contemporaries. Both Rutka and Anne were young, like Ruth. However, they died in extermination camps and their diaries are only able to witness to what they experienced before arriving there. While Anne's diary begins to testify already in 1946, Rutka's remains known only to her trusted friend Stanislava Sapinska until its publication in the 21st century. Other attempts to eyewitness include oral and some written reports of actual escapees of extermination camps. The earliest is that of Jakob uh, Grozhanowski, who makes it to Warsaw, testifies to the group around Ringelheim about the mass exterminations in gas vans at Chelno, and a written report of which is smuggled out of the ghetto by and to the Polish underground. Though published in June 42 by the Polish government in exile, it's considered by others to be fantastical, and thus it is ignored, which is similar to the fate of eyewitness reports later grouped and termed the Auschwitz Protocols. They're unable to affect a bombing of the rail lines or any other type of allied intervention. The report is produced, however, as evidence in the Nuremberg trials. Thus, the end of the war and the desire to prosecute finally make these reports legible, though that legibility comes too late to help millions of victims. I'd like you to consider too the millions of letters sent by the persecuted to their relatives and friends elsewhere. In this category belong the shocking letters of Zalman Gradowski and other members of the Auschwitz Sonderkommandos, dated 5th of September 1944 and found buried near the crematoria already in March 1945, but not published until 77 and then only in the original Yiddish. French and Italian translations become available only in 2001. Many types of images were created by individuals to tell of what was going on for them. One of the most complicated examples was created by Charlotte Salomon in 1941 to 1943 in exile in France and usually referred to as life or theater. I consider recipes that were written down or recited orally as truncated types of life narrative. Ruth reports hearing in Christianstadt oral recitations by older inmates of recipes for foods she had never even had the opportunity to try. Hence, Ruth sustained herself, as Sander has explained to us so well, reci um, not recipes, but poetry, poetry she had memorized and that she composed in her head, some of which appear in Weiterleben. Drawings and also poems of other children inter interned as Ruth was earlier in Theresienstadt, survived the end of the war and were published in the, under the title, I Never Saw Another Butterfly with the first English translation in 1964. These along with musical compositions like Victor Ullmann's Kaiser von Atlantis attest to attempts to transmit personal experiences from inside the Judaicide. Though few of these life narratives were received and read as the slaughter was occurring, Many texts survived even when their authors did not, and these could become legible in the decades that followed, even as new texts by those persecuted who had survived were being produced. As for the immediate post-war, and as Ruth comments so correctly in Weiterleben, it's not that post-war survivors didn't want to tell, but rather that few wanted to listen. I want to make sure you know, though, that in hospitals and DP camps in numerous places in Europe, survivor testimony was solicited, mainly by Jewish organizations. A different type of solicitation that is our earliest recording of actual voices is due to the European-born American sociologist David Boder, 
who leaves America for Europe to conduct interviews with survivors in July 1946. For two months in four countries and in nine different languages, he interviews more than 100 people. Some excerpts of these life narratives are published by Boder in 47 and 49, but it's not really until the publication of Newick's Fresh Wounds in 1998 and Alan Rosen's more comprehensive study, The Wonder of Their Voices in 2010, that this early effort at furthering personal testimony receives a large audience. And these are all available online now for you to hear. As for individual testifying through memoir writing, ill, malnourished, and resourceless as they may have been, numerous survivors made the effort to write about the Nazi death machinery and how they experienced it in the immediate post-war period, like Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, Victor Frankl, uh, Charlotte Delbo. Some were not published, most were not read. It would be too globalizing and highly inaccurate to claim that one or even two events created an audience for such memoir writing where there was not one in the mid to late 1940s. But in addition to the immediate trauma of the war fading somewhat as basic human needs like food and shelter are met, several types of events begin to allow larger numbers of individuals who were not directly involved to become interested in learning about what happened. Trials like the Nuremberg trials in mid to late 1940s, the 1961 Eichmann trial, the mid 1960s Auschwitz Frankfurt trials played a huge role. To these forced airings of Nazi atrocities, we could add at least one cultural event and that's the publication of Anne Frank's diary, which I already mentioned briefly. Though the first report about the diary occurs in 1946, the popularity of the diary starts ascending into the stratosphere only with the 1956 American dramatization of the diary and the subsequent American film in 1959. Some of the memoirs written immediately after the war are published, republished, or translated in precisely this period, like Primo Levi's and Wiesel's. I date the next major surge in interest to the late 1970s. From this period forward, I suggest to you, we have some kind of ever increasing, if uneven, desire for consumption of information and particularly of life narratives about the Nazi persecution. The US American television miniseries Holocaust airs in 1978 in North America and then in late January 1979 in the Federal Republic. Although Wiesel excoriates it as quote, untrue, offensive, cheap, unquote, it seems to have accelerated use of the term Holocaust, and it's credited with affecting a change in attitude of many Germans, 20 million of whom are said to have watched its first broadcast. A very different kind of event starts occurring at several university sites around the US, namely audio and video testimony projects that solicit, record, and archive survivors' stories. I'll just mention two at Graz College in Philadelphia in 1979 and the Holocaust Survivor Film Project started at Yale University in 1979 also. Of course, scholarly research is accelerating in this period. The anniversary years of the 1980s, that's 1985 for 40 years since the end of the war and 1988, 50 years since the Anschluss and the November programs also provide an impetus. Lanzmann's film Shoah is released in 1985 and the Grips Theater in Berlin produces Ab heute heißt du Zara based on Inge Deutschkorn's memoir, premiering in 1989 and reaching more than 100,000 school children over its 20 year run. This same period is rife with numerous calls by Austrian artists, Jelinek, Bernhard, Herdliga to deal with the Nazi past. Hilberg's path-breaking destruction of the European Jews is republished in 1985. The 1989 fall of the Berlin Wall and the opening of the East in general and of archives in the Soviet Union in particular bring easier access to much official and personal documentation about the Nazi period. In the wake of these political events, we get a slew of new creative works and public venues connected to the Holocaust though clearly some of these had been in the making for a long time. They all, I believe, make the life narratives that existed already or came into being in their wake more legible. 
I'm thinking of things like Spielberg's Schindler's List, 1993, um, the Shoah Foundation video effort starting in 1994 and by 1999 collecting more than 52,000 interviews or the dedication of the United States Holocaust Memorial and Museum in 1993. What I consider possibly the most important contribution to life narratives and legibility of life narratives on the Holocaust, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, is published in a two volume edition in 1991, though first panels were created as far back as 73 and the first volume became a huge success very quickly after its publication in 1986. And I'd just like to remind you that Ruth herself considers this an extremely important piece of the puzzle to stick with her metaphor. Christopher Browning's Pathbreaking Ordinary Men is published in 1992. Other events that should be mentioned as contributing to legibility and interest in Holocaust life narrative include controversies swirling for more than a decade around the Jewish Museum and the Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin, with the museum opening in 2001 and the memorial being dedicated in 2005. Jan Gross's disturbing and controversial book, Natives, excuse me, Neighbors, is published in English in 2001. I hope it, that in now returning to Vita Leben, some of the items I've mentioned will resonate loudly with you. Ruth started writing in the late 1980s, as she explains in the memoir, partly because of certain memories being jarred loose for her through a horrible physical jarring, and partly as an act of communication and friendship to those acquaintances in Göttingen who accompanied her through recovery from that jarring. And I mean her near fatal encounter with a young cyclist. She has a message and she has her receivers. Little did she realize at the time how many more receivers she would soon have. The first edition appears with Wallenstein Verlag in 92. By September of that same year, Vita Leben hits number one on the SWR bestseller list. Numerous prizes for this book and Kluger's life work quickly follow. The Grimmelshausen Prize in 93, the Österreichische Staatspreis in 97, the Thomas Mann Prize 99, the Lessing Prize in 2007, the Bundesverdienstkreuz in 2008, to name just a few. Perhaps more important to Ruth, and in any case, surely a sign of the quality of the book, a second edition is published by the much larger publisher, DTV, in 1997. As for an English version of the memoir, Ruth produces not a translation, but as we have been told by her, a parallel book, Still Alive, that first appears with the feminist press in 2001. And this, of course, has been widely and positively reviewed and read. In 2008, the 100,000 copies of Weiterleben are distributed in the city of Vienna as part of its special program, Eine Stadt ein Buch. If I think about how the city that gutted her schools, that terrorized her when she tried to go to the park, that abetted her deportation, could honor Kluger with prizes and with the distribution of her book, I think about the way the book itself incorporates and builds upon all the testifying that had gone before it, sometimes in opposition, sometimes in confirmation. Kluger's observations are witty, insightful, and biting. They refuse to stay boxed in chronologically or philosophically. Her rejection of the sentimental and cathartic is palpable throughout the work. Now, in relation to the larger history of Holocaust life narratives I've been tracing, I want to point out that Vita Leben appears at a time that reflects Ruth's anomalous position as a survivor. As Ruth herself puts it, virtually all those still alive today who have the Auschwitz number on their left arm are older than I am, at least by those three years that I added to my age. To describe this anomalous positionality a bit further, Ruth doesn't quite fit Susan Suleiman's definition of the 1.5 uh, generation, those too young to have had an adult understanding of what was happening to them, but old enough to have been there during the Nazi persecution of Jews. Rather, I think all readers of Weiterleben can agree, she had quite an elaborate understanding of what was happening, even if we hesitate to call it adult. Just shy of 11 years old at the time of her deportation from Vienna to Theresienstadt, it might help to ponder that this is the age at which cognitive psychologists consider a child able to think hypothetically, use abstract words appropriately and with understanding, and they possess a vocabulary to name the experience that a younger child lacks. 
By the time Ruth publishes Weiterleben in 1992, Primo Levi, Jean-Amery, Jorge Semprun have all become standard reading in Holocaust classrooms. So neither Ruth nor her book belong to that generation. On the other hand, Ruth's work is first read just before a whole cadre of books by the second generation starts appearing. I'm thinking of Anne Karp's The War After, 96, Helen Fremont's After Long Silence, and Lisa Apignanese's Losing the Dead, both 1999. Though I haven't done this work yet, I think some fascinating comparisons could be made between Weiterleben and works by children of perpetrators, especially because of this generational issue. Uwe Tim's Am Beispiel meines Bruders, Tim is born in 1940 and the book appears in 2003, and Richard von Schirach's Im Schatten meines Vaters, um, Richard is born in 42 and his book appears in 2005. Because Ruth includes so much about her own mother, Vita Leben shares features with all these texts that are not just about one person, but rather concern at least two generations of the same family. Similarly, they and Vita Leben contain multiple narrative strands in the sense of being concerned with the survivor's story and the story of getting that story. Ruth's book incorporates reactions of her first pre-publication readers into the text, especially to point out why she disagrees. Having just reread the book for the 10th, 12th time, I've lost count, I want to remind us how extremely well written it is. I mean this both in terms of the overall structure and the quality of the writing. I'd like to point out that at the macro level, it's structured chronologically by the major way stations in her early life, Vienna, the camps, Germany, New York, accords with decisions by many historians and archivists of Holocaust testimony who have emphasized the importance of recording life before the Judaicide, during persecution, and after war's end. A huge contribution that Ruth's memoir makes concerns the before. So many Jewish children did not survive. Born in 1931, Ruth barely knew a pre-Nazi Vienna. Just six years old when the Nazis annexed Austria, Ruth's life quickly became more and more constricted, profoundly affecting her schooling and her socialization, as it only slightly slower affected her basic health from lack of food. What reader can forget the scene where she is discovered by the well-fed baker's daughter at the movies, or her pointing out that Nazi Vienna denied her the opportunity to learn how to ride a bike or even swim? Still, when Ruth reports these details, she's not looking for pity. Rather, in one of the many passages when I can practically hear her actual voice, she writes, people say pityingly, you didn't have a childhood, you lost your childhood. But I say, this too was a childhood. Ruth's book is filled with scenes that are skillfully structured. Consider the critical scene of the selection where the inmate secretary saves her life by telling her to report her age as 15. Ruth, the author, moves between summary, scene, quoted dialogue, flashbacks, flash forwards, no mixed statements about altruism and reader address. To quote just one example of this last, listen to me, don't take it apart, absorb it as I am telling it and remember it. The recital of being run over by the cyclist effectively deploys restriction of perspective to what she knew at the time and switches at an important moment into the present tense. Vita Leben shines at the sentence level. Whether it is her opening gambit, der Tod, nicht sex, war das Geheimnis. In English, their secret was death, not sex. Or her way of reporting change in fortune, soon we were not starving or one of her many original metaphors. New York puts the remnants of my teenage years around my shoulders like a warm, if scratchy, cardigan. Her book is filled with prose worth savoring. Ruth is not apologetic about her interest in and evaluations of the differences in men's and women's behaviors and destinies. Rather, she comes at them head on. In a passage on so-called SS women, Ruth insists that in differentiating how much real power the SS, who could only be men, had, compared to the women who worked in the camps, she is not trying to exonerate women who committed crimes. But distinctions are necessary nonetheless, because 
how are we ever going to understand what happens when a civilization comes apart at the seams as it did in Germany, if we fail to see the most glaring distinctions, such as the gender gap, end of quote. In a final point, it's uncanny how much of what Ruth wrote about the totalitarian society in which she grew up is unfortunately relevant to today's world. She sees anti-Semitism as racial prejudice and that it must be analyzed along with anti-Black racism, though she does not use that term. How about this insight? Quote, no idea is so ludicrous that it can't be carried out where the taboos have been broken down and values can be changed at a whim, end of quote. I'm sure that all of us can come up with an example of a ludicrous idea that was carried out recently. And I think we just have to substitute Trumpism for Nazism in the following quote for it to fit what this country has just been through, or rather is still not done with. Quote, Nazism was the product of a highly developed civilization which was rotting at the edges and fell apart. And no one knew when and how that would happen. What happened in Germany was advanced and therefore fortuitous, arbitrary. Put differently, freely chosen. Those are chilling words. I don't believe I spoke with Ruth at any point during the Trump years, yet I feel certain that she saw what was transpiring with great clarity, the way she saw the carrying out of Nazi philosophy with a clarity even as a child and about which she wrote with such brilliance as an adult. She shared her wisdom with us and she certainly earned her rest, but we can still miss her singular voice. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Irene. That was that was really wonderful. And here's the emoji applause uh, that you have so um, so clearly earned. Um, I'm so glad that you mentioned that it was a well written book. It is a really good book. And uh, if you've read it 10, 12 times, I think I may have read read it 13 or 14 times. And it is not hard uh, to go back and begin again. Um, also, I just wanted to say you mentioned the GSA uh, keynote speech. Um, I was sitting next to her at the table that night and I turned to her to say something and this is the problem with sitting next to celebrated people. Some guy comes jumping in between us, you know, almost knocks my chair over and, you know, it, it immediately starts talking to her about something. And I let the guy know about my, you know, displeasure at this uh, assault. And he looks at me, he said, I am so sorry, but you have to understand she's a rock star in Austria. So <laughs> that is what that recalls to mind, especially with your um, mention of poetry and food or the, or the absence of food. Um, thank you very much. Um, now we have a panel of Ruth's German colleagues at UCI German, um, Glenn Levine, uh, Kai Evers, and Anke Biendara, who are going to uh, discuss uh, their experiences with Ruth, with the book, and uh, possibly touch on the papers. Um, and I turn it over to them. And I hope you guys have worked out in order, or shall we just start with Glenn? Glenn. That's fine with me. Um, and just remind me of the timing. Are we are we talking for a bit and then opening it up for questions from everybody else, or just we're using this time? How how would you like that? Well, um, as I mentioned before, it's it's you guys, and I guess if we have you know if you run out of things to say, then we will <laughs> also you know add questions because I'm sure there are some. I'm sure that'll never happen that we'll run out of things to say, but um, I really enjoyed both of those presentations very much. It's also wonderful to see everybody. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, the event that brings us together, but, uh, but I'm really happy to see uh, all, all of you guys. Uh, I think we should try and do this kind of thing more often just for happy occasions. Um, you know, I, I, I come, from the perspective of somebody who, um, you know, was was a friend of Ruth's. Um, I don't think we were very close friends, but I think we were definitely friends. And also as somebody who taught uh, with that, uh, still alive with the English version for the most part, um, over many years in a course 
on German Jewish uh, culture and history that I've, I've had the pleasure of teaching uh, at the undergraduate level for a long time. Um, and, you know, I wanted to use these few minutes that I'll take to details, detail some of the ways that I have taught with the book, uh, the ways that I've noted students engaging with it, um, of catching on uh, or not to sort of roots, layers of irony and critical reflection uh, on some of the most important aspects of, you know, the murder of Europe's Jews and also her own experiences in that uh, catastrophe. But, um, you know, in, in thinking about it um, in the wake of the violence and the abuse of truth and decency um, of just the last few months and definitely the last few weeks, um, I actually think I thought about what would Ruth really appreciate. I think she would appreciate it if I just take a couple of minutes and share uh, how I might have students read uh, and work through this memoir now in the wake of recent events, because I have not taught this course for, for a while. Um, and I know that if I, if I pick it up right now and were to teach it in the spring, I would, I would take a very different approach to how I would ask the students to read about the events there. And um, I guess I'd frame it in terms of, you know, in all the times that I've taught with it, and maybe Irene could comment on that too, or definitely Kai um, has used this book quite a bit. Um, one of the most persistent questions that seems to come up for students, uh, even after they've read it, um, is, you know, how could this have happened? in a, a, such a highly developed civilization. Um, and students remain puzzled by that um, even after learning quite a lot about it. And then I must admit, even after all that I've read uh, and all the conversations I've had uh, with Ruth as well as with numerous other survivors, um, I don't always really have a, a satisfactory you know, answer that you can give, right? Um, Ruth does address this very question uh, through the book uh, but as, as Irene quoted, uh, though I think it's in very nuanced ways, and it makes the reader work for those insights, which is partly why I love teaching with this particular book. Um, so without wanting to draw sort of inappropriate parallels between Nazi Germany and the US um, today, I, I actually think that especially since January 6th, and really over all of the last four or five years, unfortunately, that this very question, how could this have happened? Um, I, I don't think my students are gonna ask that question anymore in the same way, which makes me uh, sad and very concerned. Um, and I think we've also seen what happens when truth uh, is so relentlessly twisted um, by those in power and by public discourses that particular groups, in our case, such as people of color, uh, refugees seeking asylum in our country, transgender people, and, and a number of other sort of classified groups, uh, at the very best come to live in fear in a country in which they should never feel such fear. Um, not unlike the Jews, I'd say, in the 1930s or in the 1920s, who finally had somehow arrived at a place in Germany where they didn't necessarily need to feel the kind of fear that had marked earlier generations. And at worst, sort of real damage is being done to people, real harm, and by extension, sort of all of us. So I guess that's how I'd frame it, not, oh, how have I taught this, this book? But if I were to teach it again now, um, I would actually try and draw many more connections to the present and to recent events. Uh, in ways not necessarily that would hopefully come across as sort of preachy to the students, but but sort of get them to see connections without necessarily, you know, drawing, as I mentioned, inappropriate parallels. So I don't want to go on too long because I want Anka and Kai to have have uh, have the microphone too. Thank you, Glenn, and and thank you, Irene Kakanis and Sandra Gilman. I mean, those were really wonderful presentations, and they they, they kind of captured both. I think sort of Ruth Ruth and Ruth's writing um, for, from very different perspectives, but but they were clearly overlapping in that. What Sandra Gilman 
connected with, with, with names, I think, that, that to go through stages of Ruth in, in that way and how she rethought and, 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 and also commented on her poems and on her writing, I think that really makes, that's a central part of what makes her book so wonderful, that, that it is a constant reflection and, and a willingness to re-examine sort of what has happened, what has been written about it, and, and how to compare it then also with other things. She was never shy. She, she was never sort of insisting on, on uniqueness, but she was really insisting on comparison and, and make something sort of, yeah, to, to, to allow to analyze things again. In that. And that is um, what Irene, I think, sort of then, then showed in her presentation, where Ruth book really belongs in, in, this, in the history of these Holocaust life narratives in, in that. And, and that she was fully aware of that, what came before her uh, in, in these writings, and that there is this constant reflection on that. I mean, that they are beautiful. When I teach this, this um, sort of passages from, from her book with students, there's, for example, the, the moment when she talks about Peter Weiss going to Auschwitz. And, and when she sort of both sort of is, is very generous towards him and very sympathetic, and that, that he's kind of the best person to go there, but then also really sees the limits of, of, of sort of his attempt to go there. And she coins this beautiful word of, of um, Zeitschaft or timescape and, and trying with students to understand what she means with this word. That is so illuminating for students to, to, to understand sort of what's wrong with, with memorial sites very often. Well, what, what sort of are the limits of what we really can get in places like this? And, and there are a whole series of, of these kind of moments that allow students and, and every reader um, to really um, get the problem of, of, of thinking, of, of, of uh, remembering and of, of working with these kind of texts. The other thing that I, when I taught it, what I've noticed was that um, since she is, she is constantly moving in her writing and constantly re-examining, that also occurs with her book. I taught recently a class on, on refugees since, since the 1940s in Germany till the present. And it was her passages after she escaped from the death march and found herself suddenly among German refugees that allowed students to, to realize that, that not every refugee situation is the same. They can even be on the same street and they're utterly different in, in, in where they come from and they will, where they will be going. And she has this beautiful, unsentimental way of, of thinking about and, and writing about it. And students after the class, this was the text on refugees that they singled out as, as the most insightful for them, that really complicated for them what it means to be a refugee and to find themselves in these very strange situations. So in this, I mean, I, I really want to thank Sandra Gilman and Irene uh, Kakandis because they really captured this sort of this most remarkable, remarkable quality of hers, I think, that was that she was really constantly rethinking and, and willing to have conversations when, when she visited classes, she was most generous. I mean, I was somewhat embarrassed for some of the questions that came in that, I mean, as I guess everybody to a certain degree is, you kind of know who she is. And, and, and you know sort of what she can do. And, and then she gets these very cautious, sometimes very repetitive questions. And she always found a way to actually answer them in a way that, that, that helps students. And that was really sympathetic to these students. So this, this was um, a really, yeah, no, no, I, I, a really generous way in, in which she invited, sort of, in which she invites both in her books and in the classroom settings, sort of students to approach these topics um, with, without sort of false piety in that, and, and to, to really try to start conversations and, and to, to rethink these things. So, in that way, I think both sort of these presentations really 
help to highlight this processional sort of quality of Ruth and, 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 and of her writing. The one thing, and, and that to Senna Gilman, the, the, the only thing I ever found her shy about her writings was her poems. So that it, when, when we talked about Weiterleben, that was the one thing I was, I mean, that was where she actually asked, should I have done that? Was that right of me to introduce my poems because they are not really good, right? And then you were supposed to give an answer about her poems in, in, in this. But that was sort of the only thing, only time where I ever saw her somewhat hesitant in, in her own judgment. And, and that was about her poetry, which is wonderful. And yeah, that would can be I, all. Can I say that when she gave me the stack of poems, she gave me a whole stack of Xeroxes of badly typed poetry, right? Um, she did not give me permission to use them. I want to say that's important. She did not give me permission to use them. And when I translated the one poem and sent it to her, she was very, very hesitant about my including it in this essay. And I think it really had to do not with any embarrassment about children and poetry and bourgeois fragments and everything else, but what the placeholder of poetry was in her life. And by the way, again, that's why the Primo Levi quote and a number of writers who wrote during or immediately after the camps. So I agree with you. I mean, I, I think it's a complicated question. And by the way, I don't think that Camin is a worse poem than Todas Buda. I've said that in print. No, I think that these are great poems, and, and these are also, also, I mean, like what you said, sort of that Ceylon sometimes might demand very, I mean, too much work to, to, to get. Her poems, students can access in that, and they do allow them to, to, to start talking about this, and, and that is certainly a great quality. But that was all I, I wanted to say for now. Well, thank you um, to both to Sander and Irene for your wonderful talks and to my colleagues for going first. Um, I just wanted to add to what Kai especially said about Ruth's generos generosity and the way she dealt with students. After Ruth passed, I, um, I put uh, a link to um, her obituary on the Facebook page. And I was struck by the fact that a number of her former or my former undergraduates who I am still in touch with contacted me and commented on the fact how generous she had always been um, in classes. And there's also, of course, um, the film by um, Renata Schmidt-Kunz, I believe, the documentary about Ruth that shows her lecturing to a big group of students and you see them come up afterwards um, and talk to her. And I was just struck by this again because I recently rewatched the, the documentary when it was um, playing on Arte. Um, so that just to say that I would definitely say that the students do remember this as well and she's made a big impact on those undergraduates, even if, and the graduate students, of course, too, but the undergraduates, even if they did not always ask, ask the most astute questions, they certainly appreciated the way she um, approached them and, and gave them time and, and uh, was very generous. Um, I wanted to add just one other point that Irene, you brought up in your paper and that is Ruth's concern with gender. Um, you rightly stated that she was unapologetic in her interest in and evaluations of the differences in men's and women's behaviors and destinies and reminded us of her quote um, in which she insisted in Weiterleben that to differentiate who held power in the Nazi state, 
would be important because it makes it possible to understand what happens when a civilization comes apart at the seams, as you quoted. Um, I want to extend this point of importance, the importance of gender to Ruth's second memoir that we haven't talked about yet, and it is sitting right here on my desk, Unterwegs Verloren, which deals mostly with her academic studies and then her career in the United States. And I understand that the book has not been translated into English, but apparently into French. But the fact that it's not translated into English is kind of a shame because, not least because it, it provides a fascinating history of what it felt like to be a student and later um, a faculty member in the field of German studies in the United States from the 1950s onward. Um, when I reread the memoir a few months ago after Ruth had passed, I was st very struck, maybe more so than the first times that I read it, how it really is a study in early feminism um, and an excoriation of the open sexism and also anti-Semitism that Ruth and the few female colleagues she had at the time experienced in the field. Um, I was really struck by how hard she had to work and to strive, how many hurdles she had to overcome in order to make it into positions, academic positions that her male colleagues who were equally or maybe even less equally talented and accomplished, but were favored simply on the basis of their sex and the assumption that they would need to support a family. And of course, as Ruth makes very clear, she also had to do the same thing, namely support a family as the single mother of two sons. Um, and so in my first reading of her memoir, I think I was focused more on other issues and was not struck as forcefully as this time, what a strong feminist memoir this is also. Um, and I wonder, you know, if we could talk about this for a minute, Irene in particular, maybe also in the context of the discussions about our students, about the issue of gender, and of course, this topic has now also taken on new meanings in the context of discussions of LGBTQ issues um, that our students are very concerned with today. Thank you. Um, if it's okay for me to just jump in, uh, thank you so much, Anka. It's lovely to see you. <laughs> and I really appreciate that you did that because I had originally hoped to say something about um, Unterwegs Verloren also, and I, I just didn't have time. So thank you for bringing it up. But I also want to um, say thank you because this issue of women in the profession is something that tied actually Ruth and Dora Cohn. Dora Cohn, as I said, is a little bit older. And um, some of the stories that I do know about her own path through academia is absolutely chilling. Um, when Dorit became a professor at Harvard, she was one of only 13 women in um, tenured positions out of almost 800 faculty members. And um, in her lifetime at Harvard, she was able to see that start to change. But she had a very problematic relationship to having to be a pioneer. And I think Ruth had a level of anger that she was able to express that actually Dorit was grateful for, even though she couldn't say that publicly because of her own um, rules of engagement, so to speak. So I think this issue of what women of their generation had to go through in academia is important for our students not to lose sight of. And as you suggested at the end of your remarks, to make a kind of parallel to what are the injustices that of your generation, right? These were the injustices of their generation and the generation before me, so that people like myself could go into a situation where there are 35% tenured faculty when I, or tenure track at Dartmouth when I arrive. I mean, that was the highest percentage in the Ivy League, but it was wonderful to not have to be the pioneer, right? So it could give us empathy about those individuals who are now in that pioneering position right now and how uncomfortable that might be for them on some very practical level. I'll stop there, but thank you very much for bringing up this important issue. Shall we open up the floor to questions? Um, not sure how to call in people, but uh, 
Kai? Your, 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 your uh, picture just enlarged, so I thought you were saying something. Nope, that's a technical accident. <laughs> People could either write into the chat or they could raise their hands. And if you see them, Gail, then you can just call on them. Yeah, I can't, I can't get my chat going. I can't, I, you know, I, I chat, but uh, I can't find <laughs> it here. You have Peter um, raising his hand. Peter Pfeiffer? Yep. yep. Go for it. Um, I, I just wanted to um, sort of, um, enlarge a little, not, maybe not enlarge, but uh, sort of uh, drill down a little bit more about that um, sort of feminist streak and also that anger. I think uh, that uh, Ruth has and had much less trouble expressing um, than some other people. Um, and I always thought it was um, really smart how she um, was always incredibly direct. And there was very little, um, at least in the in the sort of interactions with her day-to-day uh, -day interactions that she would theorize endlessly about all of these things, but she always uh, pulled it uh, to something very concrete and how, um, uh, and, and sometimes, um, you know, with things that, um, that you thought, well, this is just the way it is. And then suddenly she pointed to it and it just, um, as they say in German, be schuppen von den Augen fallen, you would realize, what the hell did I just do? Or how did I not see that uh, before she phrased, uh, uh, she um, pointed this out? So I, I really thought that was always something that I uh, greatly admired about her and that really um, opened up a lot of new perspectives for, for myself. Okay, I, get, I can just speak up. So thank you so much for putting that event together, Gail, and for the wonderful papers, Irene, for giving this rich context and also pointing to so many important particulars. And um, Sandra, also for, for bringing in these documents, I was really struck by when you suddenly pulled up that newspaper article with Ruth's poem in there. And I, I, that was really impactful. And um, thank you, Glenn, for, for making it relevant in our times, of course, uh, Ruth's uh, work and, and uh, bringing in uh, the gender. And, and also, I want to, I think, echo on what Kai said, what for me personally struck me most about Ruth's work, and that is her ability to open it up a dialogue, which I find is of course, more important than ever in our times. Um, her ability to speak to us directly, and I mean that both personally, on a personal level, but also on a public level. Um, and I was a young graduate student who had just read her book and um, was really struck by it. She was willing to meet with me and discuss it in person. And of course, also, um, she engaged Germans in general, her German audience in, in this dialogue, and, and it worked. Um, they, they really responded. And at the same time, she made it difficult to just praise her, right? That's really not what she wanted. She really encouraged us to engage with her in, in that dialogue. And yeah, I think that's one of the most important things we can, we can take away from her work, and especially in, in our times where, where we really need to have these conversations of, that are difficult and um, establish dialogues. Um, any, any other ones? I, I cannot access my chat and I'm looking around for hands being waved. Hi, uh, hi Gail. Uh, yeah, let me jump in with one. Um, Regrettably, my mother, the German professor, didn't raise us to speak bilingually uh, for many reasons. I think some of them quite good. But um, as a consequence, I've really had access only to the English edition. I've struggled through a Spanish translation of the German version. But I'm wondering if any of the panelists have comments on what we readers of the English edition of uh, Weiterleben miss 
from what was left out from the German version. Um, there has been some, thank you for the question, and it's it's lovely to finally meet you, so to speak. Um, I, I There are papers on that, there are published uh, comparisons of the two versions, so I could get you uh, some of those titles. But um, I thought about mentioning that, and again, you know, I just I just didn't have time. Um, I was very struck in going through it this time because I had uh, the two versions on side by side to realize that she left out the poems in the Auschwitz section. Yeah, she decided not to put those in at all. And uh, one of the reasons I, I wanted to mention that is because um, to get to Kai and, and um, Glenn's points, my students loved the poetry that was in there. I mean, every student commented and they're only reading the English edition. So there's much less in the English edition, but what was there, they were very, very moved by. So maybe that's why it caught my eye that she specifically decided to leave out those uh, poems from the Auschwitz section. That's one very important thing. Um, the other thing is I would say that her commentary, and this speaks to uh, something that I think Peter and Carolina were just saying, um, Ruth had the uncanny ability to really address people in the sense that she didn't just make a generalization. She knew who her audience was at a certain point, whether it was an individual or a group. And she really tailored her comments so that it could reach that group or that individual. Um, I don't know if that was just a natural uh, pedagogical instinct on her part or almost a political decision on her part. So just in rereading some of the sentences because I had in my head, oh, this is a parallel book. It's not a translation. Um, I was thinking so much about how some of the flavor of some of the generalizations that she makes or sort of pronouncements about society um, are different in the German and the English edition. I haven't gone through it with a fine, tune, fine tooth comb to give you a, a concrete example of that, but you see it even when you just flip through the book relatively quickly. So she had this very specific moment, this very specific <laughs> gesture that she was trying to make to her German friends. And we have some of her German friends here. So maybe one of them would like to comment about that, but she really was, saying, what is it that I, as a survivor, need to say to you Germans about what your society caused to happen? And um, that's a very powerful kind of gesture that runs through the German translation that is different for the American audience, where, again, she's almost saying, you guys better figure out these lessons, you know, um, before it happens here, right here in America. It's kind of a different, a different message. I hope that's a bit of an answer for you. Irena, hello. Hi. Um, I'd, I'd like to add that they are actually really very different books as I read them. Um, and it's it's very m remarkable that she had those two books in her. Um, very generally speaking, I think the American English edition is a much more conciliatory um, version. Uh, it is one that is specifically addressed, I think, to an American on Anglophone audience. Um, and it is, if I may say so, and this was definitely what she told me in person, it is a, a book that is essentially addressed to her sons. She wanted her sons to read her book. Um, the, the major difference is the epilogue with um, a, a very moving and affecting um, testimony to, to her mother. And in some ways, um, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, it's a correction uh, of a first book. I would say those, those are the three major differences. 
If you would allow me to just um, rephrase that last little bit a tiny bit. Um, I do not know the family. So I'm just um, saying what I'm saying as a, as a reader. Um, but I think there was um, a beauty in what she wanted to do and the beautiful image, talk about the writing as I was trying to do, the beautiful writing in English about the relationship between her mother and her granddaughter, so great granddaughter for the mo her mother. Um, that's one of the most beautiful scenes in a memoir that I can think of, um, that love that she describes there. Um, but I would also suggest that it's testimony to what several people have said about how Ruth kept going, she kept growing. She didn't just sit with anything. And I think the not just sitting with something also includes the relationship to her own mother, that there had been all kinds of events that happened in between the writing of the German version and the writing of the American version in her relationship to her mother. And that's reflected in the book, especially in the end. And I think that's um, an, an amazing thing for any human being. I think some of us, you know, figure out our life narrative or who we think we are, and then we're kind of stuck there, you know, by choice or, or not, you know? And I, I always had the sense of Ruth as someone who just refused to do that. You know, she talks about being someone who wanted to move all the time, right? That she was good at running away. I, I love that, you know, and, but I think it's the positive sense too. She was not going to, and some of you mentioned, she didn't want praise. She wasn't going to you with her stuff because she wanted you to praise her. She, um, she was restless. She wanted to move on. So she kept asking questions, which is just a beautiful way to live. I think Mark Gelder has a question. And after that, I think we need to break for lunch. Mark? Did you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yeah, now we got you. Sorry. Um, you know, there's Ruth Kluger as the author of Weiterleben on one hand, and there's the Ruth Kluger that some of us knew, you know, to, vary, to varying degrees. And I think it comes across clearly in the presentations I just heard, but also in the particular readings. So what Irena said just now, um, her relationship with her mother, I mean, I read it very differently in the German original, a very different kind of relationship than the relationship in the English version but also the English version um, is a much more Jewish book. The Jewish Ruth Kluger that is, is much more pronounced in the English language version, whereas the German book is a German book for her German friends. At least that's how I, I read it. But at the same time, I may be confusing the Ruth Kluger I know with the Ruth Kluger that I read. And um, I think, I think one has to be, as a literary scholar, of course, the literary scholars, were, we are, those of us who are uh, involved in scholarship have our scholarly agendas and um, methods. Uh, so that's why it's also interesting to hear about the students because I also witnessed her often with my students and with other students quite a bit. And that relationship, that, that was very important that it was mentioned here tonight, but, um, you know, she was um, a very, very sophisticated, she had a very sophisticated mind. And um, she was also a very complex person who had been through a difficult past and had a, many challenges which she overcame, of course. So um, I just thought I, I would mention that, that, you know, that there were maybe some different Ruth Klugers there and we might need to sift through them to a certain degree. Any response? Or yeah, I would like to say something, actually. Okay. Um, one of the things that I, that I think we need to discuss is why, why she left out so much of the German stuff in the English version. And I think it's because, to me, Weiterleben is absolutely steeped in the German Kulturgut. 
It is, if you don't have that background, you, you won't get it. So she was very wise to leave that out for her, uh, her uh, American audience. I find it, I found it unfortunate because I am, I do know that, that, that cultural good. And I, that's why I love Vita Leben so much. But I think that's one of the reasons. It's just, she, she is part of the German Bildungsbürgertum. That's what Ruth is all about. And, and, um, and that's what Vita Leben is about as well. And I think that that's a really important distinction one needs to make. Thank you, Anna. Anything else that we need to register now, or shall we meet again? Yeah, and... I think Sarah wanted to speak. Sarah, is that right? You're you're muted, Sarah. I think I unmute. I was um, going to really sort of add into uh, or to things that other people have already said. It's um, about this qu the quality of um, well, in some ways, her fearlessness and. That comes out, I think, in terms of her, what we were, people were saying about her, her expressing herself um, and her directness. And also, um, I, I associate that with also a, a, a sort of a, a very deep impulse to connect to people. And the way to connect to people was in a straight line. And, um, and it could sometimes, and it was, and that was true but in terms of her not wanting to be um, praised. She wanted to have a sort of a direct exchange about her stuff. And I knew, I know somebody who was a, like Ruth, uh, same generation, uh, also from, came to the United States at the age of 11. And I said to Ruth something about my friend having read her book and, and Ruth wanted to know what she thought. And then when, it, when I was sort of being mealy mouth, she sort of kind of said, oh, if it's just, it'd be much more interesting if there was something she didn't like about it. Um, and uh, <laughs> and the other thing I was going to just also say is about her the way in which she kept moving forward. She and I had a conversation where she, when I turned sixty, she sort of said, sort of said to me, you know, life is just beginning. <laughs> I mean, she kind of said to me, you know, and she kind of spoke of her own renaissance in a certain way and her second life is so it was. Um, it was that was a and that was a beautiful way to live. So I just wanted to uh, echo what you had said and, and, and express my appreciation. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for the papers. Thank you for the contributions. And uh, we meet again, or most of us meet again at uh, one p.m. And Meredith will then host us. Great. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Great, 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 Thank great, great panel. Thank you. Thank you. That red thing at the bottom. Will we get a chance to read some of the um, papers? Irena, will you, will you, is this something that you'll let, let us read? I think Gail is planning to publish them. Oh, good. Uh, with Gaza, right? I, are you her co-editor? I think they will they will come out in print at some point. 